Welcome back to Sailing El Haleo. This week, unfortunately, you guys have to watch me struggle through a little bit of carpentry, and this is to make way for the washing machine and dryer, and I am no Finnish carpenter. Um, Finnish carpentry is an art form. Like I've said before, I'm a lummox. I cannot do anything that requires precision, and unfortunately, carpentry requires precision, which I do not possess. So I try to do the best job that I can, um, but unfortunately it's like me throwing a bucket of paint on the Mona Lisa. It's not good. But anyway, <laughs> if you're interested in car wrecks, you know, climb aboard and watch this one. <laughs> All right, I guess we might as well uh, go ahead and get right into it. So grab a drink, climb aboard, and let's get going. Oftentimes when I start these projects, I try and do them, I'll jump around from project to project, but I'll try and do them in some sort of a logical order that'll lead to less work later on down the line. Now, I certainly didn't embrace that philosophy a lot in the first, <laughs> which I'm cleaning up for now, but I'm trying to do things in a little better order now. So one of the very first things I did after I unloaded the boat was to get the washer and dryer to the boat. I wanted to get the washer and dryer in the boat while it was still in the water. I figured it'd be infinitely easier to do that than to try and winch them up when the boat was already out of the water. I have spoken briefly about the washer and dryer in the past, but I thought I'd kind of go through the logic of why I went with the units that I did. Now, they do make combo units specifically for boats. There are two different versions. They make very small units. The ones I've seen are very small. They run on 220 or 240 volts, whatever Europe uses, I, I forget. I think it's 240, maybe it's 220, whatever. Um, but they're very small and I didn't want to run, get another inverter and run new power out to the boat that's at an even higher voltage. I just didn't even want to deal with that. And they were very small, so that was off the table right away. And the size is important because I do have dogs and I've got, you know, bedding for myself, but all of the cushions in the boat, I keep covered with blankets to try and keep them clean. And they do get dirty, you know, after about a week, week and a half, depending upon how often we go to shore and that kind of stuff. So I do need to wash the bedding. And if a washer and dryer can't accommodate the bedding, then it's really no good for me. So that small unit was out right away for a couple of reasons. And the, the commercial units that are washer and dryer combo that they make for boats was actually just a little bit bigger than the washer that I ended up buying. And I only had one spot where the washer could possibly fit. And to put it there, there were a couple of considerations. I had a very defined space that it would fit in and the commercial unit was just a couple of inches too big. And the washer and dryer is going to, or the washer is going to sit right next to the fridge freezer. So I needed a minimum clearance between the fridge freezer and the dryer. I'm sorry, the washer. I can't keep it straight. Uh, a minimum clearance between the two so the fridge freezer could vent properly and wouldn't overheat. And the increased size of the commercial unit would have made that space too small. So that was one big strike against it and you know it kind of ruled it out right away but on top of that the drum for the dryer was the same size as the drum for the washer and it was only about 2.2 cubic feet oh and there goes the puppet dogs <laughs> we got a melee going on over here but anyway the drum for the washer for the washer that i bought was two cubic feet so it's big enough to put blankets in and the drum on the commercial unit was 2.2 cubic feet. Now, the, I thought because it's the same drum for the washer and the dryer, I didn't think that drum would dry as efficiently as a separate unit. The one that I bought has a 3.5 cubic foot drum and they both run on 120 volts and they both are 1500 watts. So they're very comparable and I figured energy consumption wise, a larger drum would dry the clothes faster at a lower energy use because the clothes could separate better 
in the drum while they're being spun. I don't know if that's actually the way it works out, but it makes a lot of sense in my head, which doesn't mean that it makes sense to anyone else. <laughs> so that was my logic there. So I did go with separate units uh, that would fit in the spaces that I had. And I did go with Black & Decker units. Uh, they're not made for boats. They're quote unquote portable washers and dryers. So they're smaller, but they are still large units. And to be honest with you, um, I'm a little bit unsure about the dryer. I don't know if I'm actually gonna end up taking it with me yet. Um, it's giving up a lot of real estate for something that I may only use once or twice. If at all, you know, I can, once I get south, I can do laundry and I can hang it outside to dry. So I'm, I'm kind of waffling on the dryer. I haven't decided whether I'm gonna take it yet or not. That's kind of TBD at this point. So the washer, the only spot that it could go, unfortunately, I am giving up some storage space for it. So in the spot below where it is going to sit, there were three cubby holes that I could fill with you know, canned goods or whatever I wanted to put down there. I am going to lose two of the storage bins behind it and then one, uh, I guess, door drawer or a door um, storage area. So I am blocking off a lot of storage area as a result of the putting in the, um, the washer. So that kind of stinks, but I do have plenty of other storage. So since it's just me, it's not really going to impact um what we carry with us we have tons and tons of storage so it stinks but it's not a deal breaker and there is one other thing towards the end of the the there used to be a bench um i, I think it was called a settee uh, where you could lay down you could either sit or lay down and that was i took that cushion out and that's where the fridge freezer went and then i had you know some uh, water beside it. So the water's out, that's where the dryer's, where the washer's gonna go. And the curvature of the hull actually intrudes on that corner of the settee that was there. And it didn't impact the settee at all because you could change the cushion shape and you know the, the back cushions for the settee when you're sitting up brought the wall out far enough that it wouldn't be hindering where you sat. However, the hull intruding on that corner did impact where I had to put the washer because I couldn't put the washer on a curved area. And because of that, there were seven inches on the very end of that bench that I could not use. So I decided to build cubby holes there. And what I've learned, I used to keep shoes at the bottom of one of the hanging lockers. And I've learned a lot about proper ventilation and airflow in the sailboat to prevent mold. I've had moldy shoes before. <laughs> Just because if air can't flow, if you have stuff packed or in a tight area against the hull, it's just a natural spot for mold to form. And I've, I've figured out a lot of things um, in certain cubby holes, how to keep the mold out of it just by manipulating airflow. And to prevent the mold from forming in the bottom of the hanging lockers, I built four cubby holes right in that seven inch space. So that is where I'm gonna store some shoes and other items. And hopefully the airflow through that area will prevent uh, mold from happening again. So I lost some storage space, but I also gained back a little storage space, space and I built it for a niche item that had been a problem in the past. And as you saw just a few minutes ago, there was a lip on that settee and that lip retained the cushions when it was a, a bench seat. And it also retained the fridge freezer, freezer while that was there, it prevented it from falling off. And unfortunately that lip had to come out uh, to accommodate the extra width of the washer. So unfortunately the washer was just about an inch too wide to fit in that space. So I had to trim that lip off and that left exposed white fiberglass, which I wasn't too keen on just leaving there. If I put the washer on and the um, fridge freezer on there, you could see that white, it just didn't match anything else. And 
there was the exposed cubby holes that were underneath that settee. So that would accumulate with debris and dog hair and that kind of stuff. So I wanted to cover that up so it looked better. And I reached out to Frank. I thought the interior was maybe mahogany. I wasn't 100% sure, but he said yes. Uh, most of it was Philippine mahogany. And he gave me a, a good lesson on uh, all of the, the wood and stuff that was in there. And that was very much appreciated. Frank's knowledge, I, I just, was amazing. I couldn't, uh, I wouldn't have gotten this far without him. So, but anyways, Frank, I hope you're not watching these videos anymore. If you are, I'm so, so sorry. But unfortunately, when I started to look into the price of mahogany and stuff with what I wanted to do and where I'm at financially, I'm just going to be brutally honest with you. I'm, you know, after that whole BlockFi debacle where I lost $75,000, I should not be in the position I'm in, but I am running out of funds. So I've definitely got enough to last this next, probably this next trip. It's probably going to be nine to 10 months. And after that, I think I've got some work that I can count on coming in that'll get me through hopefully another two years of cruising. And the good news is that this last round of upgrades, hopefully everything will be in harmony. <laughs> everything will work properly and be in sync and I'll have everything that I need on the boat to actually exist. You know, the longest I've gone off grid so far is three months and that was wonderful. I love it. I. I hate marinas. I just do not like them. I don't like docking in marinas is a pain. I'm not good at it. It's very nerve wracking for me to be around other boats when I know I don't have good control of the boat. Um, and just, I just like being by myself out in the middle of nowhere and that if I have everything I need, I'm good. <laughs> you know, if it's me and the pups, everything's great. And with these upgrades, I know I'll have plenty of power. I'll have the washing machine. I can do all the laundry. I can fire up the water maker if I need it. I don't think I will have to, but we'll see about that. I'm, I'm not 100% sure on that. But anyway, I wanted to cover up that white fiberglass just so aesthetically it looked better. And I couldn't, the, the, the mahogany was just prohibitively expensive when I started pricing it out, so. Frank, if you are watching this, I apologize. Thank you for all the knowledge. I hope to redo this someday down the line so stuff will match better. But I did just end up going with uh, sandy plywood from um, Home Depot. It's their cheapest laminate plywood. The laminate is ultra thin. You really can't sand it much, <laughs> which is ironic that it's called sandy. But anyway, it was... The cheapest thing that would look decent, I tried, I'm not, I'm colorblind, I can't match anything. And like I said, I'm a lummox, I'm not a carpenter. I, at the very best, I should have a framing hammer in my hand and the rest I have no business doing. So this is disgusting. I know it is, I apologize. Um, and that's all I can do. But Within my constraints and my budget, I had to get just some cheap plywood and stain it. I got, uh, I think it was called red mahogany stain, and it doesn't match very well. Even I can see that. But once you get uh, the fridge freezer back on top of the platform that I built for them to sit on, it is slightly wider. I do have to build up infrastructure around um, the washer and the fridge freezer to obviously hold them in place. So when we're pitching and rolling, that stuff won't fall out. But at least it looks, I won't say halfway is decent. At least it's not white fiberglass that's exposed. So I think it looks better than the white fiberglass. And it's what I could afford at this point in time. So that's what I was forced to go with. I don't like it. And, uh, but it is what it is. I did put a backing board on the new cubby holes that I made and I'm going to leave the fronts open. I'm going to get little nets across it so as to not inhibit the airflow too much. But I did need to stain those areas. Um, there were some small um, wood braces I put in the corners and then the backing board. So I stained that to match and I actually ended up restaining the entire thing. 
It, uh, you know, I did it in the hot sun. It soaked in and it dried really quickly, the stain, so I couldn't brush it to a uniformity when I originally did it. So I came back and put another layer of stain or another coat of stain on and the whole thing was a lot more uniform, which was great. And over the next few days, I did put two coats of tongue oil on the uh, new wood as well, and it soaked that up really well. The entire interior of the boat is coated in tongue oil, and I've been coming through and redoing um, the entire boat. So, you know, where, where the tongue oil has built up layers already, you know, it's real easy, but on the new wood, it soaks it up um, pretty quickly. So I put two layers on, and it looks like it's offering pretty good protection and has started to smooth the wood surface. So life is good. I have never used tongue oil before, but it's what Frank had been using on the interior of El Haleo since he built her. And so I just kept with it. And, you know, I was skeptical. You think an oil, you're rubbing an oil on wood, it's going to be oily and sticky. And But tongue oil is not that way at all. It's really great. It is wet when you apply it, obviously, but it dries to a really nice hard finish and it protects the wood beautifully. Um, water beads up on it. It's it. I'm I'm really loving it. It's a really great product. I am going to use a combination of metal strapping and wood, a wooden framework to hold the washer and the fridge freezer in place so they don't slide around as we're moving. By this point in time, I did have the entire running water system complete, and I did run the hot water side, and for the pipe and fittings, it was only an additional 50 bucks, so I figured why not do it, and then it's done. So I hooked up the hot and cold to the washer and I plugged her in and gave it a try. In order to test the washing machine, at a minimum, I needed to get the cold water side of the new running water system working. So I filled up one of the water tanks. I got the lines primed all the way up to the pump. I turned on the pump and then I went ahead and tested at the sink um, to make sure that the water was working, that it was running, and that the pressure pump worked, that it turned on and off, which it did. And sorry about the mess. At this point in time, a lot of this stuff is filmed out of order, so you'll notice continuity errors, like right now the washing machine isn't where it was in the last shot. <laughs> Some of this stuff I film weeks apart, so it just doesn't line up perfectly, so apologies. And it's a mess everywhere, because at this point in time, I had the engine or the DC to DC project going. I had the running water going. I had just, there's projects coming up <laughs> that I had going at that time. So everything's a mess. Uh, that's why the strainer for the engine is in the sink. That's why the sink is a mess. The garbage can was pulled out. So I was using the sink as a temporary garbage, which isn't ideal, but <laughs> that's just how it works when this stuff is going down. For this first test, I didn't put any clothes in the washer. I just wanted to do a quick cycle and see how long it took to fill up, about how much water it used, how much power it used, that kind of stuff. And I didn't want to monkey around with the dryer. I didn't have the, the vent hose for that, so I just didn't want to mess around with that yet. And I'm sure it'll probably consume a little bit more power when there are clothes in there, when there's a load on the motors and stuff. But I thought this was a fairly decent test of of what it would take to run it. The water pressure pump is rated at about two gallons per minute, and there are some line losses and some head pressure losses in there. So, you know, it's gonna pump at less than two gallons per minute. Uh, this was a medium sized load, and it did take about seven minutes to fill up for the wash cycle, and then another seven minutes for the uh, rinse cycle. And it, one of the reasons why I like this washer, I wasn't exactly sure how it was going to work, but it didn't have a, an agitator in the center like a big washing machine would have. And I thought that'd be, and I, I actually like that because you can get more stuff in there, like a bulky blanket, you don't have to try and wrap it around an agitator in the center. But I was also curious how in the world do they agitate the clothes? They can't just sit there. So what, you know, how is it going to do it? And they actually have water jets that pulse the water back and forth and which I thought was really cool and I thought would use a lot of power but it surprisingly did not. Now at the time when I did this test 
It's impossible to isolate anything individually on the boat. I don't have a meter that can read a current on just one line. So I've just got the entire boat. Now at this time, four fans were running, the freezer and the fridge were running, and I was bringing in about 150 watts total on solar. So I'm gonna, and that's around, that's around, uh, you know what, 10, 12, 13 amps, something like that. And I'm going to call that a wash. So the freezer when it's running and it was running takes eight to nine amps and then the fans take a couple more. So I'm gonna say the solar was offsetting what the other items in the boat were using and the washing machine, whatever the battery bank drain was, was a good approximation of how much power it used. And for that cycle, which ran for 22 minutes, it was a little bit longer because the pump, you know, it's not normal house water pressure. So, but the time really doesn't have anything to do with it. So for that cycle, uh, it used about 0.6% of the entire battery bank. So it had almost a negligible impact on our total energy consumption, which, or our total energy. <laughs> yeah, which is awesome. I was really impressed. I thought, especially when the motors were pulsing back and forth, I was watching the battery bank, you know, the total, you can see the total amps coming out of the battery bank at any given time. And it was surging you know, when those pumps were running, and that's to be expected, but it really didn't use that much power. So I was, I was very impressed. Now, the water on the other hand, it did use more, I won't say more water than I was expecting, but it uses a lot of water. Obviously a front load washer is going to be a more efficient on water use. I just didn't have the space for a front load. So I had to go with this one and it used around 20 gallons 20 to 22 gallons for the load to wash and rinse it, which is a lot, but you know, at the same time, if I'm going to start up the water maker, I need to run it every four days. So it's not the end of the world if I start using, I, I was always so miserly on water. One, I only had one water tank, I'm working on fixing the other one, but <clears throat> the one water tank is I believe 35 gallons, it's 30 or 35, you know, you can't fill it all the way to the top. But I could make that last two weeks, and that's for, that's not my drinking water, my drinking water is separate, but that's for washing um, hands, you know, everything, showers, all of that. So I could make 35 gallons last between two and three weeks, which is not too bad. Um, but, you know, obviously with the running water, I'm going to use more when I'm doing dishes than I would with a foot pump. And, you know, with a washing machine, obviously that's a big hit that drained more than one tank halfway. So it's a big water use. I don't plan on doing a ton of laundry, but like I said, if I stay at a marina, which I'm gonna try not to do, I've always tried not to do it. Um, I can use their water. I don't, and then I don't have to plunk quarters into their machine. I can use my own. But if I'm, when I'm, I am going to start up the water maker earlier and running it, you know, I have to run it anyway. So I guess that's a roundabout way of saying, yes, my water use is going to go through the roof, but it's okay. And that's all we have time for this week. I would love to give a massive shout out to my Patreon crew without your guys' support. I absolutely would not make these videos, and I know I say that every week, but it's actually the truth. I wouldn't make them. There'd be no reason to. So thank you guys for your support. It means the world to me. And my Patreon crew is Joan and Juddy Judnick, Val and Chris Alcorn, Denise and Eli Sackett, Sherry Erickson, Deb Shaw, and Matthew Spahn. Thank you guys so very much. I do have one legacy patron member. Her name is Joan Linbo, and unfortunately she has passed on, but she lives on in our heart forever. Uh, we miss you, Joan. If you are interested in joining our Patreon crew, there is a link in the description down below, and that'll take you to our Patreon page, where there are hundreds of photos and videos, uh, behind-the-scenes updates, that kind of stuff. I try and update it a few times a week, let you know where we're at, what's going on. And you would also help support the channel, which would be awesome. If you do like our content or our videos, please like, comment, and subscribe. Uh, that doesn't cost you guys anything, but it helps us out as well. 
All righty. I hope you all are well, and we'll see you next week.